violent eruptions, bizarre creatures, a hostile earth with sudden twists of fate. As the elements conspire, animals must be tough, but are they tough enough to survive the extremes of raw nature? Molten lava shoots 50 stories into the air. Rocks the size of buses crash to the ground. Our restless planet is a dramatic mix of ice and fire. Creatures that live in these extremes need to be hardy. One wrong move and efforts to survive are in vain. Rich vegetation cloaks the mountains. This tranquil scene masks a hidden killer. Death hangs over an eerie graveyard. All who come here to graze die. The smell of carcasses is attractive to this Nile monitor. The lizard's taste buds are excited by the scent of death. But is it making a lethal mistake? As the scavenger approaches its meal, things quickly turn sour. It gasps for breath as though overcome by an invisible force. What has attacked this lizard? Can it survive the hidden killer? To understand, we must wind back the clock. These are the Virungas, mountains with a fiery temperament. When calm, these volcanoes can kill. It's the morning of the monitor's fateful trip. There's a strange mist over the low lying land. This is the deadly breath of the volcano pure carbon dioxide. Any living creature that breathes it will suffocate. In the cold of the morning, the deadly odorless gas clings to the ground. The monitor is driven by hunger. If only it could wait till the sun burns off the terrible mist.
but the temptation is too great. With each breath, its lungs fill with carbon dioxide, making it gasp uncontrollably. Its tongue turns blue as it starts to suffocate. Just before the lizard loses consciousness, its luck changes. It raises its head above the level of the gas. By pure chance, it escapes the volcano's lethal breath. When a volcano really blows its top, nothing will stand in its way. The effect is devastating, but eruptions aren't all destruction. Volcanic ash makes the soil highly fertile, and burnt out cones provide sanctuary for fleeing animals. The volcano has provided a lifeline in this world of fiery extremes. It's not just volcanoes that start fires. Australia's red center is an inferno waiting to happen. Plants scorched by desert heat fuel the flames. Animals must run or hide. Not all of them make it. So how does anything survive when life can be snuffed out in seconds? The answer is plants. In this place of extremes, the plants must spread their bets. They produce millions of seeds that remain dormant for many years, waiting for rain. Plants that cling on here need to be tough, and they are. Spinifex is the meanest of all. Its leaves are packed with silica, as sharp as glass, if that doesn't deter predators, it also secretes resin. Even so, Spinifex supports a community of tenacious creatures. These Spinifex ants have found an ingenious way of using it to get food.
They use the plant's defensive resin as cement to build tubes of sand in which they house lerps. Lerps hardly look like animals. They're actually sap-sucking insects, and the ants store them head to tail in the tubes. The lerps suck the spinifex sap and excrete honeydew, which the ants eat. Without the lerps to tap the plant's potential, the ants simply couldn't survive in this land of extremes. The spinifex discourages visitors. The mulga tree actively encourages them. It produces nectar for mulga ants. In return, they protect the tree from other hungry insects. But these ants don't digest the nectar. They carry it deep into their nests in a bizarre division of labor. The nectar is collected by worker ants, who in turn pass it on to yet more ants, whose abdomens swell until they're too fat to move. They just hang from the ceiling. They've become living honeypots called repletes. Eventually, the repletes regurgitate the nectar to feed the growing ant larvae. Ants can't feed directly on the glass-like spinifex, but these termites can. Highly specialized microorganisms in their gut digest the tough plant. Yet again, Spinifex holds the key to survival. Termites live in complex sculptured homes. These mounds keep the termites cool, crucial in the intense desert heat. But the mound offers limited protection from the weird-looking echidna, an unusual egg-laying mammal. The tip of the echidna's nose detects tiny electrical signals in an insect's body, so it can home in on termites. The termites raise the alarm and try to repair their defenses. Nearby ants take advantage and attack. The ants kill the termites with formic acid and stockpile their carcasses. Later, they will use them to feed their young. Fire, heat and drought. Australia's red centre is unrelenting. But tough plants unlock its potential supporting insects, echidnas, and thorny devils. Ants feed on spinifex, and thorny devils feed on ants. This unusual lizard has an incredible way of drinking. With its skin, tiny grooves take up water by capillary action. The lizard's gulps move the water along these grooves into its mouth. In our next extreme environment, there's not even a puddle to quench your thirst. Africa's Namib Desert. 
one of the world's driest places. Continuous winds mold shifting dunes, some over 300 meters high. To survive this desert, creatures need to be well designed. They must keep cool and conserve water at all costs. Big animals have a big problem. A large body can get very hot. Fortunately, an oryx's body temperature can reach 45 degrees Celsius before it even begins to pant. If humans get to 43 degrees, they die. It's important the brain doesn't overheat, so a special network in the oryx's nose cools the blood. Oryx really have to find water. They get most of their moisture from plants. Large hooves stop them sinking into the shifting sands. In this barren environment, there are no water holes. How can you get a drink when you need one? This beetle has a cunning answer. Early in the morning, fog rolls in from Africa's Atlantic coast. The fog condenses on plants and animals. It's their only chance of a drink. When water's scarce, every drop is precious. The fog stand beetle finds a high dune and points it back to the oncoming mist. Water condenses on its shell and dribbles into its mouth. The web-footed gecko also drinks condensed fog from its body. The gecko's webbed feet spread its weight over the unstable grains. Fine, wind-blown sand is loose, so there's not much traction. Not only do desert dwellers have to contend with extremes of heat and lack of water, they also face death from below. It's a golden mole swimming through the dunes. Ripples betray the movements of another sand swimmer, a legless lizard. The lizard is dragged to its death. There are other ways of crossing sand. A Namib sidewinder has its own way of coping with the heat. The surface temperature can reach a blistering 65 degrees Celsius. Too long in one place and the snake will cook. So it minimizes contact with the sand. At any one time, only two loops of its body touch the burning surface. As the day goes by, the heat of the sun dries out any moisture left in the sand, loosening the surface even more and making it harder for the snake to move. So, the sidewinder stops and buries itself. Only a centimeter below the surface, the temperature can be 10 degrees cooler.
This shovel-nosed lizard has a more showy way of dealing with extreme heat. It dances, lifting its feet in sequence to cool them off in the desert breeze. The sidewinder is lying in ambush. A lightning-fast strike, a dose of lethal venom, and the hunt is over. Different snake, different desert, same problem. Like the Namib Sidewinder, the Sidewinder Rattlesnake has evolved an identical way of crossing hot dunes. This is the Mojave, one of North America's most hostile and complex deserts. Temperatures here vary widely. Winters and nights are freezing. Summer days are hot and dry. Hostile environments mean extreme animals, and few are as extreme as this unlikely bird. The Roadrunner, which often kills rattlesnakes. Runners rarely fly, but they can run at up to 27 kilometers per hour. Meat contains a lot of water, so road runners seldom drink. They reabsorb water from their feces and get rid of salt through nasal glands. In the morning, the sun is an ally. The roadrunner exposes its dark skin and feathers to help absorb the rays. As the sun sets, temperatures drop. Animals are at risk from the cold. Small creatures use burrows to shelter from the Mojave's extremes. While this kangaroo rat was sleeping, it was actually recycling water. Its breath rehydrates its seed store. It concentrates its urine so it's five times stronger than ours. We can only survive for three days without water. The snake and the roadrunner have to drink occasionally, but this tough little rodent never does. Kangaroo rats are superbly adapted to the extremes of the Mojave Desert. But our next place has heat, drought and worse. Salty environments are extremely hostile. Salt makes water undrinkable. But some salty plains can be home to amazing birds. Africa's Lake Bogoria, a desert in the dry season, a salty pool in the wet. The saline waters attract massive flocks of flamingo, which carpet the lake in pink. 
flamingos don't come here to drink. They use freshwater pools elsewhere. They come for another reason. This salty water is full of food. The birds stamp on the bottoms of the shallow lagoons. Their webbed feet stare up shrimp and algae. Waving their beaks from side to side, they filter out the tiny creatures. Slowly, the burning heat of the sun evaporates the water from the pan. The lake becomes saltier. What's left is soda crystal mud, a sticky trap for flamingo chicks. The salt builds up, weighing them down like a ball and chain. It's a lingering death. But the flamingos will be back after the rains refill the lake. Some salt pans never have a wet season. This hostile place really deserves its name. Death Valley. Temperatures soar above 50 degrees Celsius in the summer. Rainfall is blocked by the Sierra Nevada mountains to the west. There are less than five centimeters of rain each year. It's always hot, dry, and salty. The ground is cracked and scaly. Nothing can survive these salt crusts. The only water here is trapped in small pools, three times saltier than the sea. But even here, life has found a way. Algae, simple plants, grow in this saline solution. Hot springs heat the water to 37 degrees Celsius, concentrating the salt and driving out the oxygen. Amazing fish live here too. They're desert pupfish, among the rarest animals in the world. Some pools hold separate species, so if the pool dries up, that species becomes extinct. The algae is the only food, so that's what they eat. Yet again, a plant is the key to life at the extreme. But how can the pupfish survive hotter and saltier water than any other creature on Earth? Because special proteins in their bodies resist damage from heat shock. So it's possible to survive in Death Valley if there's water. But there are places where no amount of water can bring forth life. Some salt deserts are completely barren. Endless wind and sun and earthquakes have sculptured this land of pure desolation. This is the island of Hormuz near Iran, rightly known as the Gates of Hell. The island is 85% salt. The water here is 10 times saltier than the sea and there are no springs. But water does appear. How? 
because at night, the rocks absorb hundreds of liters of water from the humid air. A small amount of fresh water condenses on the rocks and this trickles down. The water doesn't stay fresh for long. During the day, continual evaporation concentrates the salt. But on rocky fringes, salt-tolerant plants tough it out. They guard precious water by coating their small leaves with wax. Most of the island is devoid of life. The mineral red ochre turns the shoreline to blood. It looks uninviting, but in fact, the seashore is less hostile than the rest of the island. Strange animals survive between the salty sea and the even saltier land. Fiddler crabs sift algae from the mud. They're hunted by this very unusual fish, one that can live on land the mud skipper. Mud skippers breathe air and can walk with their fins. Their eyes are on top of their heads so they can spot food from several meters away. Hormuz Island is so hostile because the salt traps all the water. In other extremes, the water is also trapped, but for a different reason. A blanket of snow covers a white frozen landscape. Howling winds and freezing sleet tear across snow-swept plains. How can any living thing survive here? Temperatures plummet to minus 50 degrees Celsius, freezing the blood in seconds. This is the Arctic, the most northerly place on Earth. A mother polar bear desperately tries to revive her dying cub. A male bear slowly approaches. Despite her best efforts, the cub seems still almost lifeless. led to the cub's plight. A year earlier, it's early spring. After four months of darkness, light has returned to the Arctic. Female polar bear emerges from her den, followed by two small cubs. She sheltered underground since late October and gave birth in December. Mother's fur is stained yellow from the milk she's fed her hungry cubs. She cleans herself with snow. In this monochrome landscape, being white is the best camouflage. Across the ice flow, a lone male bear has smelt food.
with a body weight of 400 kilos and paws 30 centimeters across, he can smash through the ice to find prey. This ringed seal can only watch. She'd left her pup in a chamber beneath the ice while she looked for food. The male tears at the fat, rich blubber and skin. An adult bear usually eats one seal every seven days. But he's not the only hungry one. The mother's lost half her body weight during hibernation. She needs to replenish her fat supplies as soon as possible. She's spent two weeks near the mouth of the den, acclimatizing her cubs to the bitter cold. Now, they must move on in search of a meal. Polar bears can cover up to 1,000 kilometers a year looking for food. They need a big hunting area. Only one in 50 attempted seal kills is successful. The cubs will stay with their mother for another year. The family continue their relentless search for food. The snow squall turns into a raging arctic storm. One of the cubs, weakened by the cold, lags behind. The mother shows the cubs how to burrow into the snow to escape the worst of the blizzard. The bear's thick fur traps body heat against the skin, but the smaller you are, the harder it is to keep warm. After the storm's passed, the mother tries to revive her weaker cub. The male is approaching. The mother's wary. Males sometimes kill cubs. But it's too late. The mother eventually gives up her dead cub. Six out of ten polar bear cubs die in their first year, victims of starvation, predation, accidents, or the bitter cold. It may seem cruel, but the male must eat anything he can to survive the bleak conditions. Miss this opportunity, and he could miss out on fathering many more cubs. Further south, the Arctic tundra, another freezing expanse of land trapped in ice. The flickering northern lights punctuate three months of wintry darkness. The sun doesn't rise above the horizon until February. There's no life to be seen. But in springtime, the tundra comes alive. It looks idyllic, but it's not. This extreme environment leads to some extreme behavior. A 
a red-breasted goose has found a nest site. But look at the neighbours. Is this really a wise place to start a home? Why would this defenceless bird choose to live next to killers? To understand this, we need to understand the fragile balance of life in the tundra. The red-breasted geese arrive looking for mates and a place to lay eggs. But the Arctic is packed with predators. Snowy owls, falcons, and Arctic foxes all live here. These hunters are also breeding and have hungry mouths to feed. Rather than eat geese, there's an alternative, the Arctic lemming. They're prolific. Females have up to eight babies every five weeks, and these young lemmings can start breeding before they're fully grown. With only a small window of opportunity to grab these furry snacks, it's time for predators to stock up, or even overstock. Snowy owls rely on lemming kills. No lemmings means no chicks. Enthusiastic males can bring too many back to the nest, where they just lie and rot. But hunters can be hunted. Both owls and falcons are vulnerable to Arctic fox raids. They'll die from any animal bold enough to wander into their nesting area. This fierce protection of their young benefits another bird. The red-breasted goose. It's also vulnerable to fox attack. So this is why it nests right among killers. The geese get protection, but what's to stop the falcon and the owl snatching an easy meal? During the breeding season, birds of prey don't hunt on their doorstep. They look further afield. The closer the geese nest, the safer they are. It's a two-way relationship. Watchful geese make an excellent burglar alarm. When the owl and falcon chicks mature, the truce is over. Overnight, goose is back on the menu. And when this happens, it's time to pack up and make a getaway. It was a forced friendship, forged by extreme surroundings. We've seen fire, we've seen ice. What happens when these extremes meet? Snow fills a wintry landscape, but things aren't as bleak as they seem. A secret warmth allows creatures to survive despite the cold. This is America's Yellowstone National Park. Intense heat from the Earth's molten core causes water to boil beneath the ice. Is this another gate to hell?
superheated water rises up through the soft limestone. It's in conditions like this that life began on Earth. This is no place for weaklings. In these pools, only bacteria can survive. Everything else gets boiled alive. Yet, because of its volatile heart, Yellowstone can temper nature's extremes. Ice studded with bubbling springs is the winter hangout for Yellowstone otters. These hot pools leave windows so otters can fish all the year round. They have special fur to keep them warm. Long outer hairs protect a dense underlayer that traps air for insulation. Halfway across the world, Japan is also in the grip of winter. Japanese cranes gather for their graceful courtship dances. They can fly away to escape cold and find food. But how do Japanese macaques survive here? No other primate apart from humans lives this far north. And we have shelter and clothing to protect us. These monkeys survive by using natural hot tubs. The temperature is a cozy 40 degrees. As with Yellowstone's otters, Hot springs give respite from snow and ice. The hot tubs don't just keep the frost out, they're good for social life too. The monkeys can groom and relax at the same time. But what happens when the monkeys get out? Don't they freeze to death? It seems not. Like otters, they have a double layer of fur. The outer layer dries almost immediately because they've absorbed so much heat. And the thick inner layer is coated with oil. So it probably never got wet. These intelligent monkeys have learned to cope with bitter cold. They use the Earth's natural warmth. Extreme places demand extreme adaptations. The price for failure is death. Hostile conditions mean a fragile existence. Plants and animals depend on each other for survival. Brutal landscapes make for specialized and bizarre creatures. When it's too salty, too cold, or too hot, raw nature can survive the extreme.